now listening to the Arsenal Therapy Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Arsenal Therapy Podcast. My name is Farhan, also known as Gunner since 96. And as always, joining me here this evening is Adam Keyes. Adam, are you ready? I'm ready, Farhan. Fire away. So, first question. Did Arsenal deserve the three points? Yes. Is there any point critiquing David Rea? Yes. And finally, is Ben White better suited at right back over Tommy Asu? Off that, no. I see that last question threw you off a little bit, so um, hopefully you're all warmed up now <laughs> and ready for a uh, jacked up, pumped up episode. I can feel the energy oozing out of you. Um, I think it's how are you feeling after that very dramatic win? Yeah, relieved. I think it's, I'm like buzzing, obviously. It's like that jumping around the living room, punching the air, screaming, come on, and uh, just absolutely buzzing when Rice scored that goal just because it was it's another big big Declan Rice moment and it's that like 105 million such a big price tag but he got the winner against United he got the winner tonight and he got the goal that brought us back into the game against Chelsea and they are there were three games that we absolutely needed the points and he has really really delivered so add in the fact that he's got like six man of the match awards in the league what a signing. Like, what a signing he is. And he's still one of those that you look at and you can't really believe that we pulled off that signing in the summer. I think that's just, it, like, obviously the, the results that it's brought. But for me, the signing of Declan Rice and what people are seeing him do, that's a statement for Arsenal. That's going to make other players of that calibre want to come. Yeah, I mean, I was I was staring at the screen in disbelief in the 89th minute as the scores read 3-3 and we were, you know, plummeting balls into the box and it was looking unlikely that we were going to get that win. I was thinking in the back of my head, um, these are the types of games you have to win if you want to you know, exactly secure a league same. title. Spurs have done it. Liverpool have done it. There's no excuse Liverpool for Arsenal drew. to not do it as well. Sorry, yeah, Liverpool drew. And, you know, I was thinking about coming on here, having having uh, you know, a different conversation than the one that we're having now and trying to um, find all the different arguments for why that was a shocking result, why, you know, despite Luton playing as well as they did, despite it being a difficult ground to go to, despite other teams struggling, Arsenal needed to win. But look, we got the job done. We got the three points. We did it in dramatic style. And it's it, it almost feels like a moment where we've... I've said this a few times already, but it feels like we've 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 announced ourselves properly. Um, I'm getting like flashbacks of you know the United the, the 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 last minute winner against United from last season, the Villa victory, and it was those defining moments where we take from those seasons and we remember back to the feelings that it gave us. And this is a similar sort of feeling, but almost a little bit different. You know, as you mentioned, it was Declan Rice that got the winner. It was um, at uh, Kenwolf uh, Road. Is is it Road? It is Road, isn't it? Road, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, the, I mean, their fans were giving it to us. I mean, it was really, really hostile environment. So were the we Arsenal fans. Like, the Arsenal fans were so loud tonight. Every play, I think everyone there sang their heart out for the whole game. It just seemed like a real party atmosphere for the whole game. And even you could see what it meant to the Luton fans. Like there was one scene, it was 94th minute, and there's some guy and he's screaming, like, come on, get in, like, get at them, kind of like that. And there was just, they panned around to the crowd and the, everyone was like that. Just meant so much to every Luton fan there. And they're going to be absolutely heartbroken tonight. And obviously, I'm absolutely buzzing that they are. But <laughs> it, look, it's one of those, I think you hit the nail on the head there with, you need to win those games. I, I saw someone put on Twitter, it's like, it's obviously three points, but is it a disappointing three points? And for me, it's not because we restricted Luton to four shots on target today. 
and Raya conceded two absolute howlers. The first one he can do nothing about. That's just really poor defending. The next two are really, really poor. And we've responded straight away after going 3-2 down, and then we fought right to the end. So for me, I think we created so many chances today that if we don't concede those two really stupid goals, I think we would have saw that game out easily. I think it's one of those where the timing of the game, of the goals made everything much worse and conceding straight after half time, after scoring just before half time, it was one of those where on a ground like that with the crowd that pumped up, it, yes, there's a sense of relief, but I think that it also showed just how good we are as a side that we've gone there and scored four because not many teams do that. Yeah, I wouldn't be looking at this game and think um, it was a disappointing three points. I mean, I was uh, reading some stuff about the Wolves, similar stuff about the Wolf get Wolves game, um, about, you know, how Arsenal were a little bit lacklustre, a little bit disappointing. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know where this narrative is coming from. I think we've, when it comes to this, in particular, the looting game, we we can see from that game that they're a poor technical side, but they have a lot of heart spirit determination and yeah. for all their hard work they managed to stick um you know stick to the game until the very last moment and sometimes that's all you need to win a game of football just belief just work as a group as a collective unit so mm. we'll 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 uh delve into it in a little bit more detail and discuss why they made it so difficult for us and why we we weren't as um you know attacking as uh, attractive as flary as we usually are or have been in the last few games. Uh, quick thoughts on the starting lineup. You and Monty um, we were discussing it in the 15 minute show earlier today, and you hit the nail on the head, really. You got the starting lineup right. So, talk me through your thoughts on it. Yeah, it was pretty much what I expected. I had put some tweets out saying that I expected Havertz to come in. White coming in for Tomiyasu wasn't really a change because of Tomiyasu's injury. It would have been interesting to see what yeah. Arteta did had Tomiyasu not got injured. So we always knew that one was going to happen. Um, the Havertz one I thought was logical given his height and how they were going to play. The You need a dual winner. You need a, uh, both on the ground and in the air. Havertz gives you that better than anyone. And look, I just felt it was a real fit for him today. The other one that I thought may have been an option, but I wasn't fully convinced would happen, was Kivior coming in for Zinchenko. It obviously did happen, and look, I wasn't too bothered about it. And all in all, on the basis of the first half, was I think Kivior didn't have a superb game. I thought it was kind of the right right team to play the game. How how did you feel about the lineup? Yeah, I mean, I feel like a broken record just repeating myself um, in, in each episode. Didn't really bother me, to be honest, much. Mm. Um, it was nice to see Kivio on the team sheet only because I think it's, it's you know, it's about time that he deserved to get a start, um, deserved to get a good few minutes under his um, feet. And yeah, I mean, Havertz playing as well. Um, good to see. Um, I... Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what 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 more to say. And there's there's no there's no real shocks anymore. We can't really ever look at a team lineup and say, oh, you know, this this is a bit strange. Why has Arteta done this? It's because he's 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 done so many different types of combinations. Or do you know what it is? I think because there are so many f players who can play in so many different roles. There are so many hybrid players. Whether Jesus plays up front, whether he's on the right or left, it doesn't matter. Whether Zinchenko is playing left in the middle he, he hasn't played in the middle but the fact is that it doesn't matter who you play everyone is here there everywhere Ben White was um you know a lot of the time overlapping um putting wonderful balls in the box um you know even Gabriel our center back at times in the latter stages of the game bombing forward on the edge of the box supporting just adding um adding himself there just to you know give options so yeah you know I I don't. I don't know at what, what at what point I'll actually have an interest, um, an intrigue into the starting lineup. But I think for now, um, I'm more interested to see how these players perform and you know what kind of 
what what kind of tactical um output we see you know on the pitch so yeah. there you go <laughs> those are my my two cents on the starting lineup um the game itself started off in my opinion uh quite lively i would have to say in the first opening few minutes especially down the right hand side martinelli sorry left hand side martinelli bombing down taking uh, his men on um until somebody puts a knee in behind him and i start to see some um patterns of how Luton were going to try and disrupt our momentum and rhythm um, by making quite a few cynical fouls. And in the opening 10 minutes, there were, I think, two or three. Um, credit to Luton, though. They were playing with high energy, taking the game to us, um, you know, really chasing us down as well. It wasn't as if you know, they were going to be in a low block and they were going to uh, just sit in a, in, a, in a tight shape, try and bide their time, try and hit us and counter. They were very front-footed. Um, and that surprised me a little bit. How did you feel when you saw them kind of coming at us so early on? Yeah, I was surprised because I was expecting much more of a deep block from the the off. And you rightly didn't. They had a lot of energy in midfield. They had a lot of runners. I think you summed it up very well earlier where you said about them, them lacking technical ability, but they have got a lot of heart, desire. They're, they run hard. They're disciplined. They're well organized. They're very, very well coached. And something Monty and I had discussed in the 15-minute show was they've only lost two games by more than two goals since August. So whilst they've only won one in their last eight or nine games, they um, I think it was one in their last eight, they beat Palace, and um, they've lost five and drawn two. So they're coming into that game without kind of a load of form. But at the same time, they're a side that they're so disciplined that they're not conceding a lot of ga- goals. Most games, they're kind of losing 2-1, one, one each, and it, they're very, very tight results. So I, I was expecting them to be a lot more disciplined, sitting a lot deeper, but very similar to what you said with uh, the Martinelli one, you could see they're going to try and disrupt. That that was the main tactic they had was, we're not going to let you play, and they did it very well, and they kept... The way they started, I was thinking they're going to run out of steam here because there's no way they can keep this going. And they really surprised me over the 90. So they, like all in all, there were a couple of moments in the first 10. Um, there was one that concerned me a bit. It was um, crossfield pass, Ben White, and um, the Luton player went for the header. White didn't really contest it, and it led to Luton getting down. And then it was over, an overhead hit pass. But it was a kind of sign of what they wanted to do, which is ping it long, get it down, get it wide, and try and get Adas into the box with runners overlapping. It was one of those because with Ben White, we used to see him just deal with those. It was a very unusual moment, and it definitely concerned me. And then, obviously, it was in and around the same time as Martinelli went down with the back. And again, when it's someone's back after Saliba last season, there is that fear that we probably wouldn't have had a couple of years ago with a back injury. You just think they shake it off. But but yeah, it was an, a kind of physical, fast first 10. But we had 73% of the possession in the opening 10. And it didn't feel like that. I think it was because Luton were kind of breaking up play so well. I think the the big thing, the big takeaway from that is when they were winning it, we were re- recycling it, counter-pressing really well and just getting the ball back and kind of getting going again. They would break it up again and it was very stop-start. So it meant that it, it felt a lot more 50-50 than it was. Yeah, I definitely did feel like that in the opening 10 minutes and then they started to grow into the game a little bit more, didn't they? Coming forward on a, on a couple of occasions, especially down the left-hand side, putting in some crosses into the box and I just felt like we needed to increase the tempo of our passing, particularly within our defensive half as well, which is a strange thing to say because if, if we're really good and if we've nailed down on one aspect of our game is being able to beat that first offensive line um, or offensive line and being able to play it into the middle of the pitch as quickly as possible um, I, there was just no pressing for, for whatever reason there was no pressing from the front and especially from players like Odegaard and Rice which again really strange like like you mentioned with Ben White, with his situation, very strange to see 
those two in particular not pressing and you know surprisingly seeing Jesus kind of leading some of the press and doing it alone and in doing so actually helping us to get that first goal um so before we you know discuss that first goal a very timid approach from us why is that is it a case that we're playing away and we need to be a little bit more tentative we need to try and ease ourselves into the game especially playing in a hostile stadium like that um or is it a case that something was off um you know, we left all our energy in the Wolves game and players are a little bit flat. What do you put it down to? I think there's a number of factors with a ground like that. So the one of the things that is worth noting is how cold it is tonight. Mm. We've got, we're into very much December weather. We're at the point where it, you really start to feel how cold it is. It's a Tuesday night. It's we played on Saturday against Wolves. We uh, we're playing in a, a ground that's really tight. If you look, I don't know if you were kind of noticing these things, but things like how close the fans are to the pitch, like yeah, there it was. The advertising boards were literally on top of you. The technical areas for the managers were tiny. The distance a player had to take a throw to take a corner. All those things, the fans are right on top of you, and everything is impacted with that. So even, for example, your run up to a corner, which will be something they will have worked on in training, but probably yesterday, because they would have a day off on Sunday, then in yesterday, probably not train today or at maybe a light session, whatever they do, but it would have been probably no ball work and not really out on the pitch either. But look, I think those those grounds where the fans are so up for it like that, they're always hard to play in because that's a tiny stadium as well. So everyone there makes a lot of noise and they go and they want to have a party. They don't know if they'll stay up. They don't know if they'll ever get back in the Prem. They're going to enjoy every minute of this league campaign, especially against sides like Arsenal. But there were concerning moments for us. There were... Um, ben White made three mistakes in the first 17 minutes. The first one was good defending from Saliba. Saliba played it out. He was trying to shepherd it out of play. Looked like the defender was going to win it, so he passed it to White. White's not switched on. They win it again and play it back in, and Saliba ends up shepherding it back out again and kind of bails Ben White out because he wasn't switched on. And then there was another one around the 17th minute. Ball across the pitch, and White goes to control it, isn't concentrating and lets it run under his studs and it goes out of play for a throw in. And those three moments, the not contesting the header, the not being switched on, and the per first touch are three things that we would never really associate with Ben White. But we've, we have seen a couple of times this season. The Newcastle goal, he wasn't switched on for that. There was a few moments against Chelsea where he had per touches. And he he has been out for a month. So it could be down to just a bit of rustiness. But there were those moments in the game, and I think that kind of sets the tone for other players when you've got someone like Ben White, who's maybe not on it fully, who's usually so reliable. But I, there was also, I think, just the factor that Luton just seemed so up for that. They were chasing everything. They were hurrying. They were just snatching at your heels. And any time you got near the ball, there were a couple of Luton players on you, but they, with their press, and I find it very interesting as well, because it was very much man-to-man, but they only went so far forward and then they stopped. And yeah. there was a point where a lot of teams will run at you and keep pressing and keep going, which Arsenal love because Saliba just sh- shifts to one side and plays it around the corner and he does it with ease and it allows us to progress up the pitch very easily. With Luton, they were letting us put our studs on the ball and they were saying, no, you play it out from the back. And it was very interesting. It was very much like what we've seen a bit of Brighton do and what City do at times, what we do at times. And for a side so far down the table, it was very advanced pressing because it was really, really disciplined with all their players. And I don't think we expected that because I think we were waiting for the kind of speed of their attackers to come at us and then to play through them. And actually the opposite happened and we had to kind of readjust from the back as a result. So I think all those factors combined made for a tense first 20 minutes. 
Mm. Well, look, eventually we get the goal and it is, as I said, it's a great piece of play from Gabriel Jesus off the ball play where he's pressing uh, the defender who uh, makes a, a, a poor back pass, um, goes out for, or, or the, the goalkeeper manages to, to get it out for a throw in. Jesus takes it really quickly into Saka, plays it to Martinelli, who all he needs to do is really basically touch the ball and um, guide it into the back of the net. Um, 1-0, really, really lovely goal. Uh, anything in I've particular that you, you want to highlight? <laughs> I've never heard you sound so sad describing a goal. <laughs> really? Yeah, you, you just, you I don't know, maybe. Seem, you seem completely unimpressed with that. But yeah, it's funny. I, I was writing a note in my phone as it all happened saying, Luton are playing so fast. Can they, hold, can they retain possession by playing with this kind of intensity? Because again, it comes back to the technical level. But um, with, with it, it was that just really quick thinking from Jesus straight into Saka. And it's lovely play from Saka because it's just that elusive body movement. He goes straight past his man and it sums up why Saka is so good. So people will show you comps of other players and say, how can you describe Saka as world class? Saka doesn't need to do those things. He takes one touch and he pulls it back and it's it couldn't be more perfect for Martin Alley. And he kind of toe pokes it into the bottom corner. but. It's one of those, you get it on target, you know where you're going and you arrive at the right place. But it was a really clinical goal and just a really clever piece of play from the three of them involved. So, And it came at a time where I thought we weren't actually playing that well for that period of play and we really needed the goal. And I thought, right, this is us now. We're going to settle here. Yeah, yeah, it definitely it felt like that moment. It felt like that moment, especially... Uh, Straight after the we we had scored the goal as well, almost immediately, um, it was half a chance from from Jesus after Havertz initially his his initial effort was blocked, headed back to him by Havertz. He has a shot, and yeah, it was uh, I think might might have gone through to the keeper, but it might have taken a deflection on the way, or the defender's block might have taken a sting out of it. Um, but it was a more positive attitude from us. You know, we were starting to increase the tempo of our passing. We started to look a little bit more. Um, aggressive in our movement, but also we we it looked like we were feeling a little bit more optimistic about you know getting into the um the the danger the danger the danger zones um and those advanced um positions on the pitch uh, until we conceded and they 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 equal you know, credit to them they equalize in a very short amount of time between the goal that we scored. Um, do you want to talk me through that goal? What what was perhaps the glaring, the glaring ob and obvious mistake, which was the marker who should have been dealing with Osho? Um, yeah, let, let, me, let me hand it over to you to, to dissect this goal. Yeah, it's funny because it all starts with uh, Jesus and um, he has a really, really poor touch on the halfway line. And gives it straight to Luton and they end up going forward and winning the corner. And that was just two minutes after his weak shot on goal. And um, he said, but it, it's one of those, I'm not sure exactly. I've watched it back a few times to try and pick up who was exactly marking yeah. Osho. And it was, that's why I gave it over he, to you. Cause I wasn't sure myself. Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I've watched it a few times. and it, it, it might be Martinelli, but I'm not sure exactly, but he he doesn't seem to move a huge amount and he manages to find just loads of space, mm. completely free header. And it, it's it's one of those you have to hand it to him and credit the the scorer as well, because yes, he gets that space and he gets a free header, but we see loads of them skied over the bar, put wide, headed out a defender, and he places it absolutely perfectly into the goal. It's a bit like um Cunha against us for Wolves on Saturday. Again, Tinchenko's sloppy ball on, in that game, usually you get away with it. And Cunha placed it absolutely inch perfect into the top corner. This is similar where the first time Luton have really got forward and got into our box to create something, they've got a free header and the player's taken it and put it perfectly into this kind of top corner where there's nothing Raya can do about it. 
yeah, yeah, there's no. One I don't the... feel like there's. I don't feel like there's any excuse for anyone to be giving him that much space. Because initially, when I saw the goal, I I like, wow, they worked it really too. well. Yeah, but then um, you you know you, you when they showed the replays and you see there's a marker whether it was Jesus, whether it was Havertz, or whether it was Martinelli. Um, at one point it might have been all three of them, but he some he somehow wriggles his way into that free space, gets you know two yards of space, and yeah, there's no excuse for him to not put it on target. But yeah, really well worked goal for them. Yeah, and just one of those it felt like. The, the the first 20 minutes were very much pinball until we scored and it felt like we were starting to calm down and get into it. And that goal just lifted the whole stadium again. But we didn't actually do too badly after it. We started to respond and, again, they didn't do much and we were able to regain control in the game. But I, th- I think the goal shocked everyone and obviously give them the buzz, the party continued and so on. But... But yeah, we, we had another chance not long afterwards where Jesus played in Martinelli and um, really good feet. And again, lovely feet from Martinelli inside the box again. And he, he smashes the shot with his left foot. And it's kind of it's kind of a nice height for the keeper. But at the same time, it's one of those that he does really well. And it is a good save. So that those kind of things were shown actually we're here to win this game. And I did like that response that we we really did respond and try to keep playing our game. Yeah, there, there was also another uh, a chance by Jesus on his favourite near post. Um, this time the strike was quite well hit and it was it was, it was saved for a corner. Uh, lovely work from Saka, who despite being hacked down, manages to stay on his feet, plays it to Odegaard, who slots, in, uh, slots it into Jesus really, really nicely. Um, so we were we were generating opportunities despite that. I guess you could you could call it the best period of Luton's uh, for Luton in that first half. Um, we were still being able to you know f- find the ball in the final third and get those little openings. Um, I did feel like though the cynical fouls were getting a little bit repetitive as the half was going on. Um, how do you feel like the referee managed to you know? referee this game in that first half because I was getting a little bit frustrated especially on Jesus who had one on the chin and then there was another late tackle on him and the referee kind of let the game um, play on but not not as many bookings as I thought that they would get I don't know maybe I'm maybe I'm clutching onto straws but um, yeah what do you think about the their approach in you know being really physical and the way that the referee um, reacted to it um, I wasn't bothered by their approach. I think if I was Luton manager, I would have come out the same way. Um, I, I, you, I'd be set up to play to my players' strengths, which are being physical, working hard, running, being athletic, and that's exactly what they did. Um, the the fouls themselves, I think there were a few fairly hard ones, and. Uh, the, the one on Jesus' chin, I think if it's anywhere else on the pitch, that's a free kick. But overall, I felt the ref actually had a decent game. I thought he was blowing things up. He was giving us free kicks. The the yellow card thing, it was one of those... I, I don't think I was tracking overly well how many fouls each player was making. So... You, you know, in some games, if you know the team really well, like say you're playing against City or United or a, a team that you know their players inside out, you're like, Rod, that's Rodri's fourth foul. I, I don't know the Luton team very well. So you're just getting annoyed about them as a collective as opposed to in, individuals. So I, I don't think I was as outraged about yellow cards, but obviously Ross Barkley got his, which he thoroughly deserved. And um, But... With the kind of the foul, and I felt Martinelli came in for some really rough treatment throughout the game. And whilst there were other players that did have some hard challenges, I thought Martinelli was really targeted by them. And he was someone that had multiple really, really kind of hard kicks in that first half. But it, it was one of those again where they were very physical, but I don't think it was overly unfair physical if you know what i mean like they were yeah they they had a plan to disrupt and 
I, I, I never felt that their fouling was the reason that we weren't winning that game. Whereas there's other games and you think they are literally stopping us playing. They're going in with really aggressive challenges. I felt that Luton were physical and like professionally aggressive without being over the top. So it wasn't like when we used to play Stoke back in the day, for example. It was mm. it was very physical, but not over the top. What about the potential penalty um, for us? Clear handball violation, corners whipped in, <laughs> defender handles it with his arm. What do you think? Again, am I clutching we, <laughs> or do I have a case? So which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the one where he kicked it off his hand and VAR reviewed it? No, no, or no. The... no, no, no it's, it's not that one. Yeah, I, I think that would have been really harsh if they had given us that. It's the one yeah, where well, the corner comes in and yeah. then you can clearly see that he handles it with his arm. He's sort of jumped almost a little bit. Um, or has he jumped? I can't remember. But I do I do remember seeing it striking his arm. Yeah, they brought it up in the commentary as well. And look, both of those, firstly, the one that hit, he kicked it against his own hand. I was thinking, right, come on, why are you even reviewing that? Move on, get the game going. Mm. You're not giving a penalty. I would actually like. Yes, I would have celebrated us scoring if we were if we went ahead with it. But <laughs> at the same time, I I would have actually been annoyed if we got a penalty for that because I think mm. that kind of thing is the kind of stuff we don't need in the game. And the fact VAR even reviewed it and the ref stopped the game was insane. But the one that you are talking about, again, I felt it was soft and. As I always say, as my measure is, what if it was against us? And I, I don't think there was enough in it to give a penalty. And I, I didn't notice it in real time either. And that's something that I think generally when your gut says in real time it's a penalty, you feel a lot more strongly about it. I, I didn't see this in real time. And it was only when I saw the replay that I thought, that well, maybe there's something there, but... It was very much in hope, and I, I didn't think it was a penalty, though. Okay, well, let's move on to discuss the final bit of action before the end of that first half, and that's, of course, um, the goal itself. Arsenal managed to score uh, a second just before the halftime whistle, and it was Jesus who who um, is at the end of this play, uh, a header, um, but really good header as well. But it's the cross from White, um, who's done it so many times as well. And again, it's probably one of the reasons, despite all of his you know, little mistakes or um, frailties, it's those moments which, you know, make him so valuable and which guarantee him that right back spot or has done so many times. Um, it's Rice who who's the one who initially plays him in down the right hand side. Plays a lovely um, give and go with Saka. Cross is perfect for Jesus and um, heads it into the back of the net. Um, Jesus, for one, I felt like had a really really good first half, and it was nice to see um, him get his goal. Um, so yeah, we're two one up at half time. Um, how how did you feel about that goal? Yeah, really good. Um, the the pass from Saka, the weight on that pass is absolutely perfect. And you can see he's kind of telling White to make the run. And he makes it. It's it, it's so perfect that White doesn't have to break stride. He hits it first time, lifts it straight over. And I, I love the, the, they had a kind of close-up of Jesus. And he's running and it's that kind of, it's almost like the slow-mo run for about six yards as he's rising into the air. And he doesn't take his eyes off the ball and just gobbles up the chance. And he needed that goal because that was, I think, nine nine games going into the, that without a goal in the Premier League. So I think with Jesus, it's more to get people off his back because I, I don't think goals are the biggest source of confidence for him because at the weekend, he was crucial to both goals. He played such a big role. And then the goal for, um, what's his name? The first goal today, Martinelli's goal, that was down to Jesus' press and then taking a quick throw and then obviously what comes afterwards. But I think that goal today, it was just so good. It was another great team goal and one that Gabriel Jesus needed. But um, it was funny in that first half as well because Odegaard had a great moment down the right. Um, 
dragged it back, stuck it through the defender's legs, and then he ended up playing in Saka down the right. And um, Saka had a couple of step overs and whipped the ball round. And it's one of those, yeah. if it was a few inches higher, it's probably going into the top corner. A few inches lower, it probably goes in. And it's just a nice height for the keeper. But look, between the assist for the goal, that effort on goal, and then his role in Jesus' goal, I thought Saka was superb in that half. Just absolutely brilliant. Really, really good performance. And one of the best I've seen him against a really physical opposition that were determined to kind of disrupt him at every time. That sound can only mean one thing. We've arrived at the halfway point of the show where I'll be taking you, Adam, and the listeners into the second part of the show. But before we do that, please give us your one word um, summary <laughs> of that first half. Scrappy. Scrappy indeed. But it was good getting that goal at the time that we did because it meant going into the second half that we were going to be um, dogged, dominant. And it was kind of the opposite, <laughs> surprisingly. Usually when a team scores in the final few minutes of the, of the first half, um, they're filled with confidence. They go into the second half a little bit more, not a little bit more, but the belief and the um, the ability to be able to play their way. And Luton came out in the second half and were, you know, just at it from the very first minute. Um, very quick start immediately moving it down the flanks. We were leaving some really huge spaces in between each player. And it, it, it kind of, I think it led to the, um, the goal that they scored. But yeah, how did you see the opening exchanges in the second half? Yeah, it, it was scrappy. It was a bit chaotic. Um, Luton started with a lot of energy and we didn't look fully composed. There was one point Saliba played a very loose pass, kind of with a bounce to Raya, and it led to him just hoofing it long because it did put us under pressure. And again, it was very unusual to see that from Saliba. And it kind of summed up those first few minutes of the half. And just then I also felt we were very static. So we a lot of the first half was grind, dig deep, engage in the duels with them, make sure that both sides, every player on the pitch was competing. Whereas at the start of the second, I felt there was almost a bit of complacency creeping in or maybe it was just cold legs or whatever it was, but we weren't quite at it. And then that was really summed up when Barkley got the ball, who Barkley was fantastic, by the way, got the ball mm -hmm. and played a kind of driven cross on the or pass on the half volley right across the pitch and no one, no Arsenal players were switched on and it ended up getting to the Luton player and it wasn't a good pass. It was one of those where we weren't switched on and just someone a bit more alive to it cuts that pass out and we end up playing. But that pass was what led to the Luton corner and we know what happened then. Yeah, it was, it was a combination of leaving those huge gaps between each player and the lack of pressing, which gave um, Barkley the opportunity to, as you said, Fred, Fred that ball through. Um, and yeah, the, the corner, the, the, the goal that we conceded, um, another corner, Adebayo this time gets ahead to it. But um, there's a bigger talking point, isn't there, about this goal? Is. It isn't the fact that, you know, Luton scored very early on in the second half. It isn't the fact that um, it was well-worked and it was well-deserved. But it was the fact that David Rea with yet again another really poor moment. Yeah, and it's. I think it's really disappointing considering how good he's been in the last three games and he's been really strong in the Burnley game. He was really good then, really good against Lons and then against Wolves as well. Fantastic, probably his best game for us. So it's one of those, if a keeper comes for that ball, they have to win it because it's not a good header. It's one of those, when you're that close to goal, 
if the keeper has missed it or you've got ahead of the keeper, you just need to get the ball on target and you've scored. And the frustrating thing is it was two goals from corners um, that firstly, we rarely concede from corners anymore. And secondly, when we do, we don't concede two goals that poorly. But it's another per moment for Raya. And I think the, the big thing is it's, again, this soap opera that Arteta's created. And I think mm -hmm. every one of us backs Arteta, really believes in him, really trusts what he's doing and thinks he's made very few wrong decisions. However, this one, I've always said that Raya and Raya, Raya and Ramsdale are two keepers with a very, very fine degree of difference between them. And I think what's happened this year is we're not really seeing either of them at their best because the two of them are always in this battle. And look, we're always very quick to shoot down a lot of mainstream media pundits and say they're talking nonsense because a lot of the time it is very biased kind of single-minded commentary. However, the range of people that have come out and said having two number one goalkeepers doesn't work from Peter Schmeichel to Gary Neville to kind of everyone involved in the game. The fact that so many people have been consistent with the viewpoint, maybe it's one of those that we perhaps have to listen to that. And it's Arsenal aren't the winners from this situation at this time. So we, we don't have two keepers given their best on the pitch. We've got two keepers who both look like they're competing every time they step on the pitch just to play the next game. And I think that's a worry. And that from Rhea today, it, it was really poor. I think that's the only way to describe it. He's not dominant. He's not. He comes out and he doesn't seem to know what he's going to do when he comes for the ball. And I think that's a major worry. But... The thing is, again, I've been very defensive of Rea. I think he is a very, very good goalkeeper. But this feeds into the Ramsdale debate. And every time one of them makes a mistake, the half of the fan base that wants the other in will just be screaming for Ramsdale. And that wouldn't happen. If, if Ramsdale made a mistake, we would complain about it. We would have moved on. And there may have been people saying we can upgrade and goal. However, having two of them just means you're always comparing the one that's on the bench to the one that's actually in goal. And that's, again, what we've seen online today. So for me, this is a worrying situation because that's a lot of mistakes Ray has now made. And I thought he had kind of put them behind him, given the last few performances. But today was a really, really poor kind of, it was a poor 10 minutes because he was good in the first half. He had a really shocking 10 minutes and then he didn't really have anything to do. So it was just one of those really frustrating. It was the, in my opinion, it was the worst 10 minutes we've seen from an Arsenal goalkeeper since Leno lost his head against Wolves and ended up getting sent off in that game. Let me ask you a quick question before I give my take on this. Has David Raya had more good moments than bad moments. You know, I was thinking about this during the game, and I think no. I think there's been good moments, but I think the the issue with being a goalkeeper is your bad moments are always going to be moments that cost teams goals. And the Chelsea one, um, and there's been a, like the Lons game. Lons, I've always felt a bit harsh because of how good the goal was. But tonight we saw two huge errors. So I was thinking about it and I, I think it's probably 50-50, which for a goalkeeper isn't good. And it's very worrying. So give, give me your take. I imagine you're going to be harsher than I am. <laughs> well, look, the re I think one of the reasons why um fans are so polarized on this topic on this argument this debate whatever you want to call it is because ramsdale has had um more memorable good moments top saves you know highlight reels than those moments that we tend not to think about which is you know rash decision making 
maybe you know poor um again one on ones but for the most part last season he managed to produce outstanding saves he he was really good on his feet and he brought an aura about him whereas i feel like david rea hasn't produced anything spectacular for us to turn around and justify what's happened here um and and, and as you and, and as you rightly said arteta's created this soap opera where by now we don't have two number one goalkeepers and this is one of the reasons why i asked you the question at the beginning which was um is there any point critiquing david rea because it seems like arteta has already made up his mind it seems like david rea is arsenal's number one ramsdale is the number two and i made the point at the beginning of this whole debacle that you know this this situation that arteta has created could have worked had the games been evenly distributed between two keepers now you know, the argument remains whether it's a realistic thing for two top goalkeepers to be given equal number of games, but it definitely would have eased their nerves knowing that they would, they, they'd be getting game time. It definitely would have um, reduced, in my opinion, the errors that we're seeing because, you know, keepers would be, would have been playing with a lot less, you know, tension and um, yeah, that kind of pressure on them. So, and, but, had it been just this goal fair enough we can maybe brush it under the carpet he was beaten by a really strong individual in the air we know that David Rea isn't the tallest we know that um, he's got faults in his game he's not perfect but he's really really good it's the third goal that amplifies everything Um, it gave me like hallmarks of another goalkeeper who's performing really poorly um in Andre Onana and a very similar sort of goal that he conceded as well where the ball I think it was a Champions League against Galatasaray the ball just rolls yeah. under him and again you know here there, there really isn't any excuses we really can't um fork him out <laughs> you know uh, 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 an excuse um he sh- he should be saving these really. I mean, it was it was really good play from yeah, Luton. Like, Let's not take it, anything away from them. It's good play, but I think you've summed it up well there with the the header to big, strong, physical forward who was causing Saliba a lot of problems during the game. He he's a real handful. When I have watched Luton this season, he's been a man that's caused every defender problems because he's so good in the air. Uh, however, so. You can point to that. You can say, look, the striker's done well, whatever. And I think you're right. If the second one doesn't happen, you can brush it under the carpet and move on. But we have seen a lot of mistakes. And then the second one, however, the, that's inexcusable. That's schoolboy. That's not even schoolboy. Look, that's basic goalkeeping. It's not a good shot from Barkley. He does well to get into the box. He moves well, he gets in far too easy, but he does move pretty well. And he shoots, keeps it down low, keeps it on target, but that should be a nice one for the keeper to see. If you get that, you keep it into your body, make sure you get down tight to the ground and you keep it in your hands because there's not enough power on it for it to really warrant him pushing it back out. But look, it's one of those where... I don't know how to explain it. I wonder, had the first mistake not happened, if that would have happened? And it's a big worry because if you're Aaron Ramsdale and you're looking at those two big mistakes, you have to be questioning what it takes for you to get back into the team. And I think if you look at the collection of errors from Ray and I, Yes, there have been a lot of good moments, and I really like him. I think he's great at collecting in the air. I thought with his feet today, he was excellent, and there was a lot of really strong moments from Rea. But he, well, they had four shots on target, and they scored because of two big mistakes from him. And I, that's the life of a goalkeeper. You are judged on those errors. You're not judged on the 50 passes you play during a game. You're judged by the two goals you let in that were a direct result of your mistakes. So... It's going to be a very, very tough lesson to learn. And I I don't know what's next here. I think that's the the big concern. It's do we have full trust in Raya? Because, yes, I think he's a super goalkeeper. 
I don't think this situation's working. And I think if Raya was our number one and we didn't have Ramsdale at the club and we had a number two with Raya clearly defined as number one, I think he would be a better goalkeeper. I also think we would get the old Aaron Ramsdale back, player with huge potential who's still only 25 if David Raya wasn't at the club. So I, I, it's a transfer that never made sense because I also think it left us one short outfield. And yes, it was an opportunity and it was a bargain. But it's again, after a game where we've just won, we're talking about goalkeeping errors. And we haven't really talked about that for the last couple of years with Ramsdale barring a few games. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask you, interested to hear from you, what your thoughts are on um, whether you think Aaron Ramsdale is capable or if he was in that situation, would he be making those types of mistakes? Because I think that that plays into why this this is such a hot debate. You know, I don't think that for all the for 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 all the um, I don't know what word you'd describe Ramsdale's natural mistakes. position <laughs> as a goalkeeper. Not necessarily mistakes, but I guess his like brashness, maybe, or his um, you know, he's a little bit rough around the edges. But for all of that. He can do the basics, you know. Ramsdale, I don't think he's ever made that big of a mistake where you're questioning whether he's able to do the basics well. Catching it in the air, being able to punch balls out, even if he makes the wrong decision, we know that he's he can he can sh- stop shots and he can um, claim the ball. He's vocal. He can play the ball with his feet as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think you make a really good point or you ask a really important question about what, Ramsdale's going to be thinking tomorrow morning at Coney. Um, because there's, I think there's no doubt that we will see Raya back in goal against Villa, right? So, you know, and January is weeks away. So it really is beginning to hot up here. Um, but yeah, tell me what you think about um, Ramsdale, potentially whether he's capable of making those kind of mistakes or not. Yeah, I mean, we have seen some big mistakes from Ramsdale over the last couple of years. So... I think any goalkeeper is capable of it. I think uh, one of the things I wonder, though, is so first mistake happens tonight and obviously a clanger, but it's still two each. Teammates pick you up, you get back at it and you go back out. If Rhea isn't thinking about this battle with Ramsdale, or because that has to be at the back of his mind, I don't care what anyone says about elite players putting stuff to their back of their mind. Every ex-pro talks about this stuff. And it's when everyone does it, it's clearly not bullshit. If it was just Gary Neville saying it, I'd call bullshit. But when you've got some of the best evers like a Peter Schmeichel saying it, there's clearly truth in it. And I think if that first mistake has to put a, a level of doubt into his head that he's probably thinking about his place, he, he's had the fans on his back, he's had the media on his back. And actually, Rhea as a character, hasn't done anything wrong. He came to a club, he got a big move, and he came in, he was very respectful to Ramsdale. He came in, he was given game time by Arteta, and Ramsdale himself has spoken positively of him as well. It's a case of, yes, he's made mistakes, but this is very much a situation created by Arteta. And I do wonder if, again, with Ramsdale, if he was in goal, We saw the mistake he made against Brentford that Rice cleared off the line. With the exception of Southampton, I don't think we would have seen Ramsdale that nervous in a game like that. So I think a lot of this is down to the situation, but but yeah, I don't know. But but yeah, but our our other signings were pretty good today, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they were, they were, they were okay. You know, by, by their standards, they were, they were all right. You know, they got the job done. Um, I, I, I was just going to say, just to finally end this portion of the um podcast, I would love for this to be, and, and I know this is, this is probably, this is definitely not the case, but I'd love for this to be Arteta just giving Rams their a lesson. Like this is what happens when you end up going on podcasts week after week, talking shit all the time. You know, because he, I felt like Ramsdale was entering a really like 
weird period in his career where he was getting a little bit overconfident of himself. Maybe he felt invincible. Maybe he felt like no one could knock him off his, his place. He came in, he took Leno's place. He wasn't going to let anyone else take his place. He was, you know, really quite vocal about um, his abilities as well. You know, in the moment where he was describing how he, his, what goes through his head with Ian Wright, um, not being yeah. focused, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe this is Arteta just, just, giving him that harsh reality like look you know you're going to be our number one but i need to i need you i need to do a few things here to make sure that you know you grow out of this phase as quickly as possible humble you a little bit i mean i've heard crazier things so i genuinely <laughs> don't know i think yeah. this is a man that said he wanted to sub keepers mid-game so honestly that could be something in his mind i don't think it is but at the same time I, I I just I don't second guess Miguel Arteta just because I think when we think he'll do something he generally does the opposite so so yeah mm. let's okay. wait and see. Cool. Oh, yeah, right. Very far and Ronsfield so, is free uh, for the Arsenal therapy board. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? You've now planted a seed in my head now. Um, okay, look, we 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 we're three two down and this situation. You know, I, I think I think I think Raya will feel well, you'll feel very lucky after that last goal that we scored to to steal all three points. But had we not scored uh, as early as we did after conceding the Barkley goal, um, it would have been a lot more difficult for Raya to recover from because I don't I don't see us, you know, winning that game um, had Havertz not leveled it. Did you see this goal oh, coming though? Because it kind of came from nothing. Yeah, what a player, you know. Look, okay, before we talk about the goal, let's talk about Havertz's performance because I'm usually either really critical of him or I give him his praises openly when he deserves it. But I felt like this was one of those games where taking that goal away and putting it aside, Havertz was a little bit mute. And I don't know, again, whether that's just his nature and, you know, he does things that doesn't necessarily need to be flashy in your face doesn't need to be everything doesn't need to happen on the ball it's his movements off the ball and Thierry Henry was highlighting it at half time discussing you know in that first goal sorry the second goal where um Jesus heads it in but it was the two men his, the right his, yeah his movements take those two players away from, and opens that space up for Jesus so are we are we just you know being football fans where we're not analyzing the game at a level that it needs to be analyzed or was Havertz just you know having a typical Havertz performance no today I thought he was really getting stuck in so I, I think that's how I would describe his performance it was like sleeves rolled up getting on with it so he his pass completion was much more, lower than normal However, I felt part of that was down to he was more adventurous with his passing. There were some really good moments. Um, he went in for a lot of ground duels. I think he contested eight ground duels and something like 11 headers, and he won about half of each. So he was really getting stuck in, and that's usually for Arsenal, we'd be coming out with, if you're contesting eight duels, you're winning about six. And I, I, that was a measure a lot of how good Luton were as well as just like how we were competing. And I think that's something we often forget is there's two sides on the pitch competing. And the big thing that we've already discussed about Luton is they're disruptive. They're good at winning duels. They're good at putting you under pressure and they're good at stopping you play. And I felt that Havertz was one of the players that was very key to kind of just being in the way at times. Like it wasn't a silky smooth performance, but there were a lot of good touches. There were... There was a lot of positive moments from him. I think both movement and some moments on the ball. There was one in the, I think it was after his goal, but he gets the ball, he wins it in the halfway line, he drives forward and he plays it out to Saka on the right. And then Saka ends up uh, running into the box with the ball. But these kind of things are things that we haven't been seeing Havertz do. And we're slowly starting to see him get to that level. And I'll be honest, if, he's coming away with lower passing numbers because he's trying to create things. I'm happy enough with that. 
it's like I don't need my creative player having a hundred percent of their passes completed because they've been passing sideways. And that's what we were seeing from Havertz with the ball going sideways and backwards. We're now seeing a player that's turning and looking up and looking at the pitch in front of him rather than what's behind him. And that's what we signed him for. So yeah, the goal itself look, Gabriel Jesus was superb in that moment. The way he holds off the defender gets the the yard of space and it's one of those that's a tussle where he has to react and the minute that ball falls to him he has to get that rid of that ball quickly and play it but the pass itself was just weighted perfectly and that's a really difficult one to do when the ball's in the air you're tussling with the defender and he made it look like he just does that for fun and that's where i guess the street style samba scrappiness comes in that he can do those things under big pressure so Brilliant ball in, and very similar to what we saw against um, Lons, where it was Jesus again, and Havertz just runs into that space and took his finish really well today. I think the Lons one was a bit awkward. This one was a very clean strike, and very much he knew where he was going. And he looked like a very different player as well, with in terms of confidence, the way he carried himself, his stature, and. I think his body language is always just a bit gangly and languid, but there, there was clearly more confidence when he got the ball. There was more intent, and th that goal couldn't have come at a better time, as you said. Um, I was hoping you would continue speaking, because as you can hear in the background, there's a crying baby, and... <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't just, uh, I don't have the privilege of uh, putting it to one side or locking it in a cupboard. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try but, and speak over it. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll yeah, let you we, carry on speaking. Yeah, well, we had some moments after that. And I think it was one of those, whenever we scored that, it was a bit wild. It was one of those, like, what is going on here? Like, what kind of game is this? And I, I thought we were going to, like, build on that momentum and keep going. But it obviously didn't happen and it took a long time. But there were a couple of things happened after or in and around the goal that I think are important to mention. So one of those, um, just actually four minutes after the goal, was Zinchenko came on. And I felt Zinchenko gave us something that we were really lacking on the pitch, which was a bit more technical ability. Um, Martinelli coming off was, I think he had been kicked a bit all after all evening and he came off for those reasons. And Trossard, when he came on, worked hard, got involved, but it just felt like Trossard was a yard short on everything. Every ball he got to, it was like, if you were just that wee bit quicker, you would have got there. And there were quite a few where it was like a toe to the ball great position and he did okay but i didn't think he had a huge impact zinchenko however i thought just give us something that we were really lacking there was one moment he played a very similar one too to the one he did against wolves and again i, I find it funny with zinchenko because he had a sloppy pass against wolves that we ultimately got away with and still won the game but in that game he lost possession more or less than Declan Rice, Tommy Asu, Gabriel. And it was only Saliba actually lost possession less than him in that game. And he only misplaced four passes. It just so happened it was where those passes were played. And he also got an assist in that game. So, but yet people were saying online that Zinchenko repeatedly lets Arsenal down. But again, I felt he came on tonight. He gave a sense of leadership on the pitch. He lifted everything. And I think when he came on, we were really lacking a bit of technical control. And he gave us that because I don't think KVR had an overly good game tonight. He seemed to struggle a bit on the ball. He struggled with some of the physicality in the game. And look, it's not an easy game to be thrown into that. It's one of those when you haven't played a huge amount of football, that's a tough place to go. So that substitution for me, I think, really helped us get a lot more involved. And we had a lot of chances tonight. I think that's one of those people will say, oh, did Arsenal get away with one? It's like, actually, we dug a hole for ourselves and managed to climb our way out of it because we had 24 shots. And as I said, they had four shots on target. We had nine shots on target. And 
it was, I think they had six overall. We had 67% of possession. We had a big penalty call for Gabriel late on where he's pulled inside the box, which honestly, I have no idea how that's not a penalty. Like Gabriel nudges into him first, but he's literally pulled back. You can see a couple of the angles where he's going to have that ball, but he's actually pulled away from it. And those kind of moments just went against us tonight. So, so yeah, but the, the introduction of Zinchenko, I felt was a big moment in the game for us. Yeah, you know, what what was, um, as you were speaking there, it got me thinking about the amount of, uh, the number of combination passes we were making on the edge of the box in that last 10, 15 minutes and how important Zinchenko was in all of that build up and in linking up um well with uh, Trossard and 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 others um i think there was a moment near the end of the game just before we got the fourth goal where um it was really lovely play on that left hand side um between Gabriel Trossard and Jesus sorry Zinchenko um who you know they work it really nicely Zinchenko puts a cross in Havertz heads it just over the bar um, and, you know, there was two or three different occasions where those types of really nice, neatly worked passes were being made. And as you said, it was Zinchenko. He made the difference. He added that depth of field, which was needed in that technical field um, department, sorry, in order to just open those spaces up a little bit more. And you could tell, you know, just before, just I think just after they came on, it felt like a little bit of a stalemate situation where both teams were... Um, competing with one another, Luton, Luton fully believed that they could beat us, having you know scored three goals and um, entering into the final phase of the game. But then, especially you know, as you as you as you as you were speaking about the Gabriel um, incident in the box as well, just moments after that, Saka being taken out as well. That one, I guess, being a little bit more softer. Um, but you could tell that Arsenal were gunning for that fourth goal. Um, everyone was, you know, racing forward. Luton looked like they were just d- defending desperately. Um, White with a brilliant cross into the box. Havertz flicks it on for Trossard, who's unable to keep it. Um, and and you know, Trossard again coming on, adding energy. Very very late on a thirty yard strike, twenty five thirty yard strike goes just wide. Um, and as the as as the seconds are ticking by, I'm just sitting there, hands on my head, thinking, you know, we're gonna draw to <laughs> we're gonna draw to loot and uh, not it, it not being a, a totally devastating um, result. I was thinking of you know the game that Liverpool are gonna play tomorrow and how that's gonna impact us and whether we're gonna be able to hold on to that top spot um, until Christmas. And then the moment happens where we get the goal in extraordinary fashion. So talk me through the goal. Yeah, just um, one of those, again, we win the free kick, everyone goes forward. And uh, you can see Odegaard and Zinchenko tell them everyone to get forward. And uh, I think Zinchenko it is that hits the free kick, comes out and it's played to Odegaard, or played to Zinchenko or Odegaard, well, and then it goes back to Odegaard and just kind of that has a quick look up, scans before he receives the ball, hits it first day into the box, and then Declan Rice. What a moment. Just one of those. Like, when when you need a big player, you need a player like Declan Rice. And it's, as I said earlier, he's someone that I really can't believe that we've pulled off this signing. And the points he's won us this season, it, it was funny because I didn't think he had his best game tonight. I still think he was really, really good. But I looked at uh, Sofa score and he, he had 90 touches. And there were times, especially in that last 20 minutes, where you could see him really demanding the ball and really taking charge and directing. And look, the goal was just one of those kind of euphoric moments, not quite Bournemouth last season. I think because of the running and everything, Bournemouth just felt bigger. But at the same time, this was more a sense of relief because we had done more than enough to win the game. We've conceded 
three goals, two of which were down to our own hour, or three, actually all three, but two down to Howlers. And um, we still scored three goals on a ground where people aren't scoring a lot of goals. So it is funny that man of the match was awarded to a centre-back who conceded four goals today. And uh, <laughs> yeah. they... Look, it was one of those, we absolutely deserve that result. And it's a relief, but one that showed that we can go for the the full 90. And Alan Shearer has been moaning that there was an extra few seconds added on at the end of the game and um, that Arsenal shouldn't have got that time because it was scored in the 97th Brilliant. minute and six <laughs> minutes of added time. But look, these things happen. And unfortunately, Alan, hey, look, have we have to, to respect the referees. Yeah. Right, you you took the words out of my mouth. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> we just have to respect the officials and uh, you know go by what the the final decision is made. Unfortunately, guys, it's just the way the game is played. Um, perfect. Well, look, I think we've um, we've spoken about the game at lengths, and we have hopefully um, given that last moment the justice it deserves. Um, Arsenal four, Luton free, and so. We finally arrived. It's time for Yes, that's right. Good, 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 bad, where we will be giving you our good moments, our good, good moments, and our bad moments of the game. So Adam, why don't you kick us off by giving us your good moment of the game? Um, I'm gonna go with Havertz goal. Very predictable, but <laughs> it was a good moment. So I'm not, I'm not going to take that away from you. Um, my good moment of the game was, um, it's going to be a bit of a wet one, but my, my good moment was seeing everyone getting around David Rea um, after the, the first howl up. Really good to see, similar to what we saw against Wolves. Just really nice togetherness, which is what we need. And you know, speaks speaks volume of the character in the squad. You cast your mind back to a few years ago, where when we conceded, if we if we inevitably, whenever we did concede a goal, everyone's heads would just drop. And you're looking around the pitch, mm-hmm. trying to find a leader, anyone to just pick everyone up. And now all of a sudden we've got 11 leaders on the pitch, which is amazing. So that's my good moment of the game. Um, give us your good, good moment of the game. Oh, it has to be the winner. And I'm shamelessly saying that. So yeah, I, I don't think there's anything else that tops that. Yeah, you're right. So, and so coming into second place, I think... We all love the moment where Jesus was shushing the crowd as he scored his goal. Because <laughs> at that moment, it was, you know, it was, it was becoming quite frustrating every time. It's like players like, for example, very early on, Martinelli got fouled um, and he, was, he looked to be in quite a bit of pain. And then every time after that, he picked up the ball, you could just hear rounds of boos just ringing around the stadium and just, I just yeah. what the hell like he hasn't done anything wrong here um and then the same with jesus, jesus as well got fouled a few times and then the crowd were upset that you know he was making a meal out of it um and so when he scored his goal to see him shushing the crowd as he was celebrating was was brilliant so that's my good good moment of the game and finally adam give us your ugly moment of the game it has to be ray a second hour Oh, I meant to say bad, but that was pretty ugly. So I am gonna, I'm gonna let you have that. That was a very ugly moment of the game. Um, I think my bad moment of the game moments. is, yeah, well, yeah, well, there you go. So instead of a bad one, I think I'm gonna replace it with ugly. And so you've gone for the second one. I'm gonna go for the first. So unfortunately, David Raya, you're you've come uh, at the end of our ugly moments, and hopefully, um, you can lift yourself up because the next game is against Villa and it is going to be massive. I think of all the games in the December fixture list, that one scares me the most. And we do have a few tricky ties coming up. Um, We've got Liverpool and Brighton. We've got a tough month. Liverpool, yeah. We have got a very tough month. But look, the first away game out of the way. Um, Two more to come. And hopefully the next one will see another three points on the board. Okay. Good stuff. Well, 
it's that time of the show again where we must say goodbye. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's listened up until this point. Thank you very, very much. If you did enjoy this episode, please do give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Let us know what you thought of the show by reaching out to us on Twitter. You can find us over there at Arsenal Therapy. You can also find Adam over there at Adam Keys underscore Monty at ATP Monty. And you can find myself over there at Gunner since 96. As always, we will be back next week to give you your usual weekly dose of Arsenal therapy. But if you can't wait until then, make sure to head over to the Arsenal Therapy YouTube channel for the 15 minute show and the preview show. So until then, take care. Have yourselves a lovely week and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.